During World War II, there were many people who were condemned to death for their actions and resistance. There were many war criminals who at the end of the conflict were executed for their crimes. Many were taken to the gallows inside of Allied controlled prisons for their deaths, but there were other shocking execution methods used during the war. Some people were deceived and tricked into going to their deaths within parts of concentration camps which were very well hidden and concealed, and some people were even crucified inside of a forest. The conflict showed the brutality and evil of so many people, and some of the worst execution methods in the complete human history were deployed during the war. Welcome to the Fortress. Today we look at the most brutal World War II execution methods, and to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Inside of Treblinka, there were three different regions of the camp, with the aim of this site and intention of it to exterminate as many people as possible. Victims arrived inside of the reception area, before they were then sent to their deaths being forced to run through what was known as a tube. This was a fenced-in path, which led to the gas chambers where guards drove prisoners, with no way out. The gas chambers were fitted with a diesel engine that pumped in carbon monoxide, which killed hundreds of thousands. After this was done, the Sonderkommando prisoners then collected the bodies for them to be burned inside of the ovens in the open air. But for those who were not able to walk to the gas chambers, such as the elderly, they were executed often inside the lazarette. This translates as infirmary in German, and it was made to look as if it was a medical facility or a small hospital. It was decorated with red crosses, and people believed that they were getting some medical treatment when they were taken there but the only people waiting for them were executioners armed with their weapons, pistols and rifles. These victims were shot in the lazarette to ensure that the killing process did not slow down, and there were special executioners who worked here, such as August Mitar. He was known as the Angel of Death of Treblinka, and he later stated at his trial regarding the lazarette that there were always sick and crippled people in the transports. There were also those who had been shot and wounded en route by the SS, policemen or others who guarded the transports. These ill, crippled and wounded passengers were brought to the lazarette by a special group of workers. Inside the lazarette, they placed or lay these people at the edge of the pit. When all the sick and wounded had been brought, it was my job to shoot them. I fired at the nape of the neck with a 9mm pistol. Those shot would fall into the pit. The number of people shot in this way from each transport varied, sometimes two or three, sometimes twenty or even more. They included men, women, young and old, and also children. The lazarette featured a large pit where bodies were burned, but the victims were sat on the edge of the pit, where an executioner approached them from behind and then executed them. A former prisoner of the camp said of the execution zone that, a German with a machine gun is waiting, and with one burst puts them all out of their misery. They fall into a huge fire-filled ditch that occupies most of the area. Two of Kurland, a carpo's helpers, try to arrange the piles of corpses so they burn quickly and completely, in order to make room for the new victims that keep streaming in. It was ruthless, and every day there were many people being brought for their executions. Another guard who worked there was Vili Mentz, the gunman of Treblinka, who stated that in the region of the Lazarette, there were mass graves, and those who were shot were also laid on the edge of the pit, or grave, where they were shot. Mentz admitted that he shot these victims with his own pistol, that following this their bodies were covered in lime and were then quickly burned. He also admitted that when prisoners arrived at the site, that there were often as many as 20 people who meant shot with his pistol. Another former prisoner claimed of the killing process in the lazarette that, ahead of me a bored sentry sat on a little chair clutching a rifle. Before him down below was a deep pit. At its bottom were heaps of corpses which had not yet been consumed by a fire burning under them. I stopped in my tracks, paralysed with terror. The sizzling half-burnt cadavers emitted grinding and crackling sounds. The flames, once having enveloped them, either dissipated into little jets of smoke, or reignited into a blaze, which forced firewood and corpses into the devil's embrace. Here and there I could make out the torsos of men and women or little children. The smell of burning flesh reached my nose and prompted the flow of tears. Just then the old men began toddling up the bank, three or four metres high, in front of me. Stepping hesitantly, they suddenly caught sight of the pit and its contents. Aware that they had stepped into a trap, 
the miserable souls tried to escape as best as their exhausted condition permitted. As they scattered across the little platform, however the guard pumped bullets into their heads and shoved them into the pit. The point of the lazarette inside of Treblinka was to ensure that those who could not walk through the tube to the gas chambers could be executed in secret, away from this part of the camp, to make sure that the slaughter was not slowed down. It was a ruthless execution method, as people believed they were getting some form of medical care, but they would be then led out towards a pit, where they were slaughtered by gunshot. Thousands died in this area of Treblinka, and it added to the horror and evil of the camp. Inside of Germany, the guillotine was known as the Faubile, or the Drop Axe, and it did differ from the guillotine slightly. It was mostly metal, as the guillotine used in France utilised a wooden frame, but many of the early German Faubiles were the same as the French devices. The German executioners innovated, and they created a smaller metal structure for the execution, and these were said to have required less maintenance, and they were also longer lasting. One device, the Hamburg Faubile, was utilised up until 1933, and this specific device was strange, as it had a blade and a release mechanism, which was slightly different. With this device there was a hole in it, on the scaffold, where the body would be dropped down into the scaffold after the execution, for the body to then be placed in a coffin away from the eyes of many, as the Hamburg Faubar was surrounded by a big wooden shed, giving greater privacy. This was found within the walls of the prison, which was also not public, but when Hitler rose to the position of Chancellor, and also when he seized power, he would order the creation of more Faubiles, and he also would put these execution devices to work. There were thousands over the years of the Third Reich who were executed on the device, and one of the most famous to lose her head on this was Sophie Schall. She was a member of the Brave White Rose movement, and these young resistors were involved in distributing leaflets across Germany, telling people to ignore the lies of the Nazi party, they would eventually be found, and the White Rose came crashing down. Sophie Scholl, along with her brother Hans, following their arrest, were given over to the Gestapo, and they were interrogated, and were then tried for treason against the Nazi state. Following a hearing at the People's Court, they were sentenced to death, and Sophie Scholl, the young woman, was to be executed on the Faubile. She was executed by experienced executioner Johann Reichhardt, and he was said to have been the master of the Faubile, and he would execute 3,000 people himself inside of Hitler's Germany, most of those people who resisted the regime. However, Johann Reichhardt claimed that Sophie Scholl was, when she faced her death, the bravest person he ever had to execute. The device used to execute her was actually recently found, and can be actually viewed inside of a museum in Bavaria. But there had been other women who were executed on the device before, as Greta Bayer, was executed on it, decades before Hitler rose to power. She had been condemned for poisoning her fiancé and shooting him, and she did not love this man, but she thought murdering her husband was the easiest way out of her marriage. She was executed on the Faubile at just the age of 22. Many of those men and women who carried out the executions wore their smartest clothes, and these were gentlemen who were not butchers. They were hated across Germany, as many saw them as legal murderers, but they were men who were said to have been very skilled at using their instrument of death to take the heads off their victims. Some even experimented with their devices, and one was even said to have had a pipe connected to it, so that the blood from the falling blade would then be taken away, would then drain straight into a sewer system. Many of the devices had metal baskets fitted to them, which collected the head of the victim following the fall of the blade, and sand was thrown underneath the device to catch a blood, and also sawdust was. These execution devices were slightly smaller than the French guillotine, and the executioners used a metal gliding frame, and kept the blade straight when it fell through the guillotine, and this allowed greater reliability as the device fell onto the neck. The blade of the device was also very heavy, meaning when falling at speed, little could go wrong as it sliced through the neck. The executioners working inside of Hitler's prisons could execute prisoners very quickly, and they could take a head off within a matter of seconds of someone entering the execution chamber. The victim would have been secured to a board, and the victim would stand on a footrest, as they were then secured and strapped to the board. This would then be quickly slid under the blade, and someone was then locked into place, and the blade would be released and the lever was pulled. The Nazis kept very strict records of executions, and they documented exactly what happened with them. 
There was some which took just seven seconds from when someone entered the execution chamber, and a bell rang out throughout the prison, and this told everyone that an execution was occurring. Also inside of the execution chambers, often the execution was performed behind a curtain, adding more privacy for the executioner to conduct his miserable work. Inside of Nazi Germany, executioners were paid roughly 3,000 Reichmarks a year, and they would also be given a bonus of around 65 Reichmarks with each execution, and some became rather rich. They lived in villas and nice houses, in the best parts of cities or in the countryside, and the Nazis even charged the families of those who they executed. Every execution cost 300 Reichmarks for the family to pay, and a 12 penny cost was even accounted and collected for the cost of sending the letter to the family. In the years which Hitler was in control of Germany, it's believed that 16,500 people were executed on the German guillotine, and it was said to have been a very efficient way for Hitler to get rid of his enemies. It was a rough thing for many, and most people in Germany knew of someone who had lost their head on the device. One doctor even said what was worse was a trip to the dentist, which was said to have been more painful than execution using the foul bile. But there were very few limits to the brutality of the device, as 17 year old Herbert Hubener became the youngest person executed by the Nazis. He was 17 years old, and he questioned the Nazis in his writing and pamphlets, and he claimed in one of these. German boys, do you know the country without freedom, the country of terror and tyranny? Yes, you know it well, but are afraid to talk about it. They have intimidated you to such an extent that you don't dare talk for fear of reprisal. Yes, you are right. It is Germany, Hitler's Germany. Through their unscrupulous terror tactics against young and old, men and women, they have succeeded in making you spineless puppets to do their bidding. Of course, for the Nazis, they believe this was treason, and with this Hubener, despite being a teenager, was executed on the foul bile. This took place on the 27th of October 1942, and at 8.13pm in the evening the blade fell upon his neck, and his final words to the judges at his trial were, Now I must die, even though I have committed no crime, so now it is my turn, but your turn will come. The foul bile was used at the end of the Second World War, and there were some accounts of the Allies using the device to execute war criminals in Germany, after the conflict had come to an end. There were a few who were killed on the device under German courts, despite usually gallows being used inside of prisons for war criminals. The British utilised the device to execute people condemned by German law. However, within some of the most brutal prisons of the Third Reich, the foul bile was used often, and each week the device was being used to take the head of those people who were dissenting or resisting. They were even taken to occupied lands such as Czechoslovakia, where inside of prisons many Czech people who resisted the German occupation were slaughtered and killed on the foul bile. But what cannot be forgotten was the execution device, which became popular during the French Revolution, was borrowed by the Third Reich and by Hitler and was adapted to become more ruthless. It had a long history inside of Germany, as executioners looked to their neighbours for inspiration with the execution device, but Hitler's skilled set of executioners could take a head off in around 10 seconds from the point where they entered the execution chamber. Anyone who dissented would face the ultimate sentence, and they often lost their lives resting their necks under the slanted blade of the foul bile. The Einsatzgruppe were paramilitary death squads of the SS, who followed the German army. They rounded up many civilians who had been left, following the advances of the armed forces. Each Einsatzgruppe had many different firing squads, and it's believed that these forces shot more than 2 million people. The executioners forced victims to dig huge pits and graves on the edge of the settlements in their hometowns. They were then taken in small groups into these pits, where they were then shot by firing squads. Sometimes the firing squad was stood on the edge of the pit, but at other times there were executioners who patrolled the pits, and they ruthlessly executed their victims in cold blood. They would order the victims to lie down, often on the bodies of those who ten minutes earlier went into the pit before them, and the executioner, the Einsatzgruppe soldier, then pulled out his pistol, then delivered a shot into the back of the neck, in the nape of the neck, that resulted in their instant execution. There were some rare accounts of victims surviving this being grazed by the bullet, but they then woke up and managed to survive, with the bodies of other victims on top of them but this was usually the case when many people were shot on the edge of the pit, and the next shooting was said to have been more efficient, 
as the pistol of the executioner was pressed right into the neck of the victim. Genickschuss translates as neck shooting in German, and it was a method in which millions were executed. It was used inside the concentration camps as mentioned. There were special chambers found in camps such as Buchenwald, known as the Genickschuss and Lager. These were false medical facilities found inside of converted stable buildings, and they utilised deceit. They were made to look like doctor's rooms, and Soviet prisoners of war were marched into these rooms, and they were then told to prepare for a medical exam, and they entered the room, and they stood next to the height measuring device. But when they were stood there, a hatch behind them was then opened, and behind was stood an executioner with his pistol. The weapon was then pressed against the neck of the victim again, and the executioner shot, into the nape of the neck. This was a method of execution in which thousands of prisoners of war were condemned by. Inside of Auschwitz, the deadliest concentration camp of the Second World War, there were many prisoners who were executed by shooting, and specifically neck shooting. It was usually one bullet per prisoner, and despite gassing being the most common method of extermination and death in the camp, when the crematoria and gas chambers struggled to cope with the sheer amount of people to be killed, neck shooting was used. Operation Hearst saw 430,000 people, in May 1944, brought to the camp to be slaughtered, from Hungary, and this took place over 56 bloody days. It was said to have been too much for Auschwitz, and the crematoria could not cope with the bodies. But the gas chambers could not cope too, and mass pit executions took place, and victims were forced to undress, and they were then led to a hidden fire pit by members of the Sonderkommando, those prisoners of Auschwitz who were forced to clean up the deadly operations of the camp. The victims were then led into the pit where an SS executioner administered a gunshot to their neck, and the victims were then burned in the huge pits. Genickschuss, or neck shooting, was one of the most common execution methods used by the German forces of the Second World War. Tragically, it was more proficient and cheaper than utilising firing squads, who would stand opposite groups of victims, as if they missed the German authorities, saw this as a waste of a bullet. By utilising one executioner with a pistol, who could not miss, it was one bullet per victim, and millions of people were slaughtered in this method during the Second World War. It was certainly one of the most ruthless execution methods. Still found standing at many of the concentration camps as a reminder of the imprisonment and incarceration are the perimeter barbed wire or electric fences that surround the camps. These were vital for the SS guards to ensure that prisoners stayed in, and they claimed the lives of many prisoners. The conditions of the sites were so terrible and brutal that at times some people just simply walked into the fences to end their lives because they could not live any more with what was happening to them. One very famous prisoner of the concentration camps, who was held inside of Sachsenhausen, was the son of Joseph Stalin, the Soviet dictator. Yakov Zhugashvili was imprisoned inside of the German camp following his seizure on the battlefield, and his own father turned down a number of prisoner swaps for him that could have saved his life. Stalin saw it as the ultimate shame that his son had been captured, and he would have preferred it if he shot himself on the battlefield, rather than to fall into the hands of his enemies. For the Nazis, it was a huge propaganda coup, having the son of Stalin locked up inside of Sachsenhausen. But on the 14th of April 1943, Yakov Zhugashvili died inside of the camp. There were differing accounts of his death, including one that he'd been shot by the Germans, or that he'd been involved in a fight with British officers. It was claimed after the war by British soldiers who were locked up inside of Sachsenhausen with him, that Yakov Zhugashvili, following having a fight with a number of prisoners, then ran into the electric fence surrounding the camp, and that he died from electrocution before an SS guard then shot at him. It was claimed that he'd been driven to do this, such were the conditions of the camp, that he chose to end his life this way, dying through electrocution. The high voltage fence would have killed him before the bullet probably did also, and it was claimed that this was the case with his autopsy. Inside of Auschwitz, the electric fence for many was a symbol of their suffering, and the fact they would never get out of the camp alive. Regarding the fence at Auschwitz, it was claimed that electrical current for the fence, as indeed for the entire Auschwitz camp, was supplied by a power line from the electrical generating plant at Sersha Verdna. Two separate lines ran from the main substation in Babis to the main camp and to Birkenau, and a range of other destinations including the city of Ozisem, the train station, the tannery for example. 
The transformer station at Babis stepped up the current running to the main camp from 5,000 volts to 30,000 volts. There in turn at another substation, located in the grounds of the former tobacco monopoly building, the voltage was stepped down to 6,000 volts and to 400 volts, at which point it was connected directly to the camp fence. This was a three-phase current. As a result, when prisoners escaping from the camp attempted to short-circuit it, they managed to cut off the power to only a portion of the fence, and in places, that came as quite a surprise to them. So some prisoners did attempt to shift the current of the fence, to then plan an escape attempt, but it was a brutal sign of their fate. It was also said of the fencing in Auschwitz that, taking into account, as well as the internal fencing between the individual sectors, and the separate fencing on the grounds of the crematoria and sector Canada, the total length of the Birkenau camp fences would be 17,189 metres. Adding the fencing segments planned later brings the total fencing at Birkenau to 18,668 metres. This shows how large Auschwitz was in its scale, but it was also claimed regarding the current that, since transmission of low-tension electric power over long distances involves a considerable loss of energy, the Birkenau camp fence, much larger than that of the Auschwitz one main camp, would also use a significantly higher voltage, 760 volts. It has been disputed that the current for the electrified fence around Auschwitz-Birkenau may have been switched off at certain parts of the day to conserve power, or that it was kept live during roll call in the morning and the evening. But also near to parts of the fencing were guard towers, where prisoners were constantly watched over by armed guards, and if someone made a step out of line towards the fencing, then the SS guards would not hesitate but to take a shot at them. Some SS guards even played sick games themselves, as they would purposely throw the caps of the inmates towards the electrified fence or into it. They knew that if the prisoners went to retrieve their caps, then they would either be shot at by the guards in the watchtowers, or they would be pushed into the electric fence by the other guards, or forced to walk into it. Some guards did this, and they forced inmates into the fences, and there are some harrowing images of people lying dead on the fence. The SS guards at times tended to play sadistic games with the prisoners of the concentration camps, as at Mauthausen they utilised the quarries to execute prisoners, and so would either force them to push a prisoner in front of them off the precipice in cliff face, or this person would then be shot. It was certain execution, and for some of the guards the fences became a gallows where they could condemn prisoners. It could be used as a torture method too, and as a way of mocking prisoners and getting them to confront possible death. One punishment method used in the camps was that the guards forced a prisoner to stand in between the narrow strip of ground, between the electric fence and the second fence, and the prisoner knew that if they touched either of the sides, then they would probably be dead. The strip of ground was just 60 to 80 centimetres wide also, and it was terrorising, knowing that one slight misstep, and someone would be executed. When some of the camps were liberated, a number of prisoners went on the offensive, and they murdered and reprisal killed a number of their guards and carpos who had treated them in such terrible ways. One commandant who was killed during the liberation of the Gusen camps was Franz Zieris, the commandant of Mauthausen. He succumbed to his injuries, but then the former prisoners of Gusen took his dead body, and then hung it from the fence of the camp to act as a message to those about the actions of the man that caused so much suffering. His body was then covered in swastikas and messages such as Heil Hitler, in an ultimate sign of Nazi shame. For many prisoners of Auschwitz and the other concentration camps, the fences did not just act as a reminder of their incarceration and suffering, but they were also used as an execution method. The guards heavily patrolled the perimeters of the camps at all times, they would not hesitate but to shoot a prisoner if they encroached on the fence. Prisoners were also pushed into the fences to their deaths, and some even voluntarily walked into them, such was their suffering. Today many of these perimeters stand around the former sites of terror. They are a powerful reminder of the past, and the terrible conditions that people were kept in during World War II. Mauthausen Concentration Camp opened on the 9th of August 1938 and the first inmates of the site had been sent from the first concentration camp of Dachau which was set up inside of Nazi Germany. These inmates were forced to construct much of the new site which would be later used for slave labour and after much research by the SS officials they settled on the construction of Mauthausen being where it was due to the close proximity it had to a granite quarry. 
The camp was created around this, and also there were good transport links, as it was found close to Linz, the hometown of Adolf Hitler. The granite that was mined inside of Mauthausen previously was known to have been very good quality, and it was even used to pave the streets of the Austrian capital, Vienna. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis planned to construct a new Germany and a new capital, and the plans were huge in their scope, and for this Hitler needed a huge amount of granite. He did not want to spend huge amounts of money on resources, building new buildings and construction projects, when he had one eye on a new global conflict. Hitler preferred to spend more of the German money on the military and improving armaments production, and because of this the solution was to use prisoners of war and slave labour to work inside of Mauthausen, to mine the resources that were needed. Mauthausen became one of the largest complexes inside of the concentration camps, and some of the subcamps were huge. But there were many other factories constructed around Mauthausen, and many other companies used the prisoners to work inside their factories for free, or very little, which would then be paid to the German Reich. The conditions of Mauthausen were terrible, and there was a huge issue with overcrowding, and the barracks that the prisoners lived and slept in were not sufficient for the amount of people inside of them, and because of this there were many diseases which spread around the camp. One of the biggest issues with Mauthausen was that accidents and incidents from work were very common, and there was a medical facility established in the site, which was known as a Krankenlager. But there was no medicine given to prisoners, just very basic first aid, and a number of experiments took place inside the camp, and the average life expectancy of the inmates was roughly six months from when they arrived inside of Mauthausen, and as the war rolled on and continued, the life expectancy just became three months. As the war turned against the Germans, the food rations inside of Mauthausen got even more stretched, and they decreased, and prisoners were too weak to stand, and those who could not work were sent to extermination sites, such as the nearby Hartheim Castle, where they were forced into gas chambers, when they believed they would be given some form of care and medical treatment. But one of the most ruthless and horrific elements of Mauthausen, which was certainly one of the most striking, was the stairs of death. This was a huge set of stairs, which led to Water Quarry, where much of the granite was being mined, and then taken to the main camp. The stairs were 186 specific stone steps, which were all uneven, and some were very large, requiring a prisoner to clamber up them, and the inmates were forced to carry heavy stones, weighing up to 50 kilograms, up and over the stairs, many times a day, from the quarry. It was harrowing work, and this was made worse as the guards drove the inmates up quicker, beating them and striking them with their whips and other weapons. This usually led to accidents also, and if a prisoner in a queue of prisoners up the stairs fell, then they could cause a domino effect of dozens of people then falling down the stairs, which was very dangerous. They were forced to carry these boulders all day, and this was exhausting work, and was some of the most severe labour used inside of all the concentration camps. But there were many different ways in which prisoners were executed by the guards, and the SS officials and guards, for example, even forced some prisoners to walk into the electrified fences around camps such as Auschwitz. At Mauthausen, the guards used the quarry and the stairs of death to execute prisoners and inmates. They played a horrific game, which was known as the Parachutist Wall, or the Fauschum Springer Wand. The guards led a collection of prisoners up to the edge of the quarry pit, above the stairs of death, and they then at gunpoint ordered them to stand in a line, with one poor soul stood on the edge of the cliff. These prisoners were then told that they would participate in a sick game, and they were then told they had the option of pushing the prisoner in front of them off the cliff, or if they failed to do this, then they would be shot on the spot. It was referred to as the parachutist wall in a very sick way, as throughout the day the prisoners would be thrown off the cliff face to their deaths. And of course there was absolutely no chance of survival, as the inmates crashed into the stone quarry below them from a huge drop. The fact they were either forced to take the life of another inmate and prisoner, or they would be shot, was a harrowing choice, and some did face the bullet of the SS executioner, there and then for their refusal to push, but others, under immense duress and the threat of their own lives, did do this and pushed other people off the cliff. It was kill or be killed, and the prisoners did not have a choice to do this, or leap off the cliffs themselves. A former prisoner claimed about the work inside of Mauthausen's quarry that, 
If you stopped for a single moment, the SS either shot you or pushed you off the cliff to your death. And the decision to take part in the parachutist war or not was one which prisoners had to very quickly make. There were many guards who worked at Mauthausen who became known for their brutality, but only a select few were sent to their deaths inside of the execution chambers of the Allied prisons for their actions. Many SS guards managed to escape, and the parachutist wall was a horrific and terrifying game that the SS played, they would throw dozens of prisoners off the high cliffs to their deaths. Mauthausen was known for its death toll, and over 90,000 people succumbed to the horror of the site, with extermination through labour policies leading to the life expectancy of just a matter of months from when an inmate entered Mauthausen for the first time. The stairs of death and the quarries was where a horrific amount of terror was inflicted upon very vulnerable people, and whilst many were hard at work in the quarries, it was known to see people plunging from the cliffs to their deaths, being driven by the SS. Inside of the concentration camps there were many doctors who worked for the SS, and also nurses along with other officials. Inside of the hospitals and medical bays where they worked, there was little to no care given out, and many inmates knew that if they were sent to the infirmary, then there was a very good chance they would never get out alive. They feared the medical experiments of evil SS doctors, such as Josef Mengele, the Angel of Death, but they also feared an execution method which was known, inside of Auschwitz, as the needle. This was putting prisoners to their deaths by using an injection of a substance to the heart, or through the blood supply. Much of the injections administered contained a chemical called phenol, which was toxic to consume on its own. Today this is found in tiny amounts inside of mouthwash and also other cleaning agents, but when injected straight into the heart, this killed the victim instantly. This method of execution was used by the SS doctors to execute and kill sick prisoners who they thought would never get better, so they just dispatched them quickly. This was done at Auschwitz inside the procedures rooms in the hospital blocks of Auschwitz I, the main camp, and the prisoners were led into the room, they were then told to sit on a stool. At this time a prisoner functionary or a carpo would stand behind them and then pull the victim's arms back as the SS doctor or nurse then stabbed the needle directly into their heart and they were killed within just a few seconds. It was ruthless and horrific and inside of Auschwitz it was noted that almost 2,500 prisoners were killed in this manner in four months in 1942. The injections were also used to kill children inside of different regions in Poland and also pregnant Jewish prisoners within the camp. The gas chambers would become the most lethal execution method within Auschwitz, but the needle continued to be used inside of the camp, and they also injected air into prisoners to kill them. The needle was used to murder people under the Action T4 program, where nurses inside different sites of the Third Reich slaughtered disabled people en masse. The Nazis realised that exterminating smaller groups of prisoners was more economical and less costly by using injection. One victim of a phenol injection was Maximilian Kolber, a priest who suffered inside of Auschwitz, and he was starved for a number of weeks, but he did not die from his treatment, and to make way for more prisoners in his cell, he was then slaughtered by using the needle to his heart. One doctor, Josef Clare, was known for killing using phenol injections to the heart, and he worked on different ways of speeding up the killing process. He practiced and experimented on victims in different positions before giving the fatal dose, and he was a doctor within Auschwitz. It was said of his work inside the deadliest camp that the prisoners were not exclusively those seriously ill or exhausted. Some were here only because Claire did not like them and put them down in the needle list. There was no way out. The butchers were also different than in the beginning of the camp. Nevertheless, I do not know if they may be called degenerates. Claire used to murder with his needle, with great zeal, mad eyes and sadistic smile. He put a stroke on the wall after the killing of each victim. In my eyes, he brought the list of those killed by him up to the number 14,000, and he boasted every day with great delight, like a hunter who told of the trophies of the chase. Joseph Claire did avoid the hangman's noose for his crimes and actions. It was not just at Auschwitz where lethal injection was administered, and there were other sites such as Buchenwald, Dachau and Bergen-Belsen, where medical officials slaughtered inmates using the needle. 
It was a barbaric execution method, and many people realised that a trip to the hospital or infirmary would result in their deaths, and there was little to no chance of them ever getting out, as the medical officials would kill them. There were some SS nurses who were executed for their crimes, and the courtrooms learned of their execution using the needle. After the prisoners died, they were usually wheeled towards the crematoria, where they were then burned inside of the ovens. The needle was a feared and terrifying execution method of the Second World War that saw thousands succumb to it at the hands of medical officials, many before who had practised medicine for some years, but instead of caring for people, they became murderers and executioners, more content with taking the lives of thousands of people for the Nazi Reich than making them better. The Einsatzgruppe were sets of SS death squads and executioners, who were responsible for the mass murder by shooting of civilians and victims of the Nazi policies during World War II. Following the invasion of Poland, the group were put to work, and they rounded up people after the Germans rampaged into the lands, and they organised executions. The most prominent method of killing was using large pits, which also became the graves for millions of people. The group were under the direction of the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, and were supervised by the Butcher of Prague, Reinhard Heydrich, and they worked with other Nazi groups to carry out as efficient slaughter as they could. When it came to other war crimes and executions of civilians, killing pits were used a lot during the conflict, as they were then used to become the graves, which were covered over. Usually with these sorts of executions, the armed forces would advance, and then the Einsatzgruppe arrived and categorised and sorted the population of the newly conquered lands. Those who were then rounded up and were marked for death were then taken to a clearing, normally on the edge of a village, town or settlement. These first victims were the ones who were ordered to dig the pit, and they would then be the ones who dug the graves in which hundreds more bodies would then be interred inside of. Following the digging of these deep pits, usually the victims were led into the pit in groups. There were two different methods of execution deployed by the SS within the pit. One of the most common was to use a sole executioner, who worked in shifts with other men. The victims were ordered into the pit, and they would be often standing on the bodies of those who went before them, and these people were then ordered to lie down on the bodies of those who went before. The SS executioner then came up behind them, and administered a single gunshot, in the nape of the neck, with a pistol or rifle, and this was known as genixus, or neck shooting. The SS realised that they could use one executioner for the killings, instead of firing the squads. But these were also deployed, when there were many to be killed at once with more haste, as the firing squad would stand on the edge of the pit, and they would then fire into the victims, when they were ordered to do so. This was the method in which millions of people were killed all across occupied lands, during the Second World War. There were some harrowing accounts of people who did survive the killing pits, and they, once the dirt had been piled on the bodies on top of them, did manage to scramble out playing dead. This was rare, but after the executions had taken place, the SS men then made extensive efforts to conceal their crimes. The land was recorded by the SS as being a site of a major war crime, and often trees were planted over the graves to hide what had happened. But there were examples later of groups of men being forced by the SS to dig up the dead corpses and then burn them in huge pyres, reducing the remains to ashes, which were then buried. Inside of a forest a few years ago in Poland, the remains of roughly 8,000 victims of the Nazis and the Soldau concentration camp were found. There were roughly 17 tonnes of ashes discovered, and these had been the people who were killed in execution pits, who were dug up and then cremated. They even found some possessions from the deceased. There were some huge-scale massacres carried out during the war, with thousands being executed in a matter of days, and this was systematic slaughter on an industrial scale but sadistically the Nazis even made arrangements for some of their executioners, as they were concerned about the mental toll of being responsible for thousands of people's deaths, and what this was doing to the minds of the gunmen. Many of the killing pits of the Second World War are still undiscovered today, as the Nazis aimed to hide and conceal the remains of their victims. They managed to hide many of their crimes, and made big attempts to do so, but there were some who at the end of the war were condemned for their involvements in the executions. Every year victims of the Nazis are being discovered, and their stories are being told, 80 years after the deadliest conflict in human history came to an end. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, 
And once again, thank you so much for watching.